Thanks, Lloyd, and welcome back to those of you joining us who were with us for yesterday. I, I recognise names. I, I think all of you were here for Module 1 yesterday. It's good to have you back with us. Today, we're looking once again at Pearson at Excel International Advanced Level uh, Physics, and this is the Welcome to Pearson Module 2. What we're looking at today in this training, you'll hopefully understand the assessment objectives for the qualification, to understand the question types for the qualification, understand the mark schemes, and practice using the mark schemes a little using uh, some of the exemplar student work, and hopefully, and also learn a little bit about the support provided by Pearson around assessments and exemplars. Uh, my name is Keith Penn, and I'm a lead science trainer for Pearson having been a science teacher to GCSE and physics to A-level for 33 years in London and the southeast of the UK. OK, let's start with the welcome to Pearson. I think you all saw this yesterday, so I'll just, this is just a sort of recap. OK, Pearson, the company, uh, we are the world's leading learning company and as the UK's largest awarding organisation, best place to provide qualifications aligned to the British educational system. We have a heritage that stretches back over 150 years and we offer globally recognised qualifications to over three and a half million students a year. We have six and a half thousand schools, colleges and employers who use our materials and mark over 10 million exam scripts on behalf of the Department of Education each year, operating in 70 countries across the world. An overview of the assessment. Uh, this is kind of recap on something I introduced briefly at the start of yesterday's session. Looking at the assessment module, you'll rem uh, model rather, you'll remember that units one, two, and three add together to make the advanced subsidiary the first half of a full A level, and they con uh, consists of unit one and two content. Unit one being mechanics and materials, and unit two waves and electricity. Both of those papers are assessed by a written exam, which is 90 minutes long and accounts for 80 marks each, which is 20% of the full advanced level for each paper. And both of those papers include multiple choice, short open, open response, calculations, and extended writing questions. Unit three is slightly different in the assessor's learning from the uh, knowledge and understanding of experimental procedures and techniques which have been developed while students did experimental work while studying the content of Unit 1 and Unit 2. And the paper includes the same range of questions except for multiple choice, no multiple choice questions in the Unit 3. It's a slightly shorter paper, 80 minutes long, and accounts for 50 marks and 10% of the full A-level. And mirroring that sort of pattern, uh, units four, five, and six for the other part of the full advanced level, what we call the uh, uh, advanced two, A2. Units four, five, and six follow the same sort of pattern. Units four and five are content modules, unit four being further mechanics, fields, and particles, and unit five, thermodynamics, radiation, oscillations, and cosmology. Slightly longer papers, one hour, 45 minutes, 105 minutes, uh, and account for 90 marks, but still account for 20% of the full advanced level. And they include the same range of questions as we saw in units one and two papers. Unit six is similar to the unit three paper in that it assesses students' knowledge and understanding of the experimental procedures and techniques which have been developed in units four and five, and of course, in units one and two. It includes the same range of types of questions, except for multiple choice. Once again, Unit 6, like Unit 3, has no multiple choice section, and the paper is 80 minutes long and accounts for 10% of the full advanced level. A statement which appears in the specification on more than one occasion and is worth repeating at this stage, students will be expected to apply their knowledge and understanding of content and practical skills to familiar and unfamiliar situations. OK, so that's recapping things we already mentioned yesterday. Let's move on to look in a bit more detail at the assessment element of this course. The assessment objectives, first of all, there are three, arguably four assessment objectives because assessment objective two breaks up into two parts. Um, so uh, I draw your attention to the percentage weighting of the assessment objectives, which are in the columns on the right that shows the percentage in the advanced subsidiary 
the percentage of the A2, the percentage in the full advanced level, which is the AS and the A2 together. Assessment objective one, which is largely recall, demonstrate knowledge and understanding of science, accounts for around 33% of the full advanced level. Assessment objective two is new to the grid in the specification. It inspects before this one, there was only one assessment objective two, but now it's been split into A and B, with B being the new part. So assessment objective two part A is application of knowledge and understanding of science in familiar and unfamiliar contexts, and is uh, counts for around 35% of the total uh, marks in the A level. And AO2B, the new one, is analysis and evaluation of scientific information to make judgments and reach conclusions. And that accounts for around between 11 and 14% of the full A level, okay? And assessment objective three, is only tested in units three and six, and it, it is about experimental skills in science, including analysis and evaluation of data and methods. It's worth just mentioning that the assessment objectives underpin the construction of the paper. So the number of marks that are allocated, for example, to assessment objective one, will determine the number of questions that can be asked in a particular style. And as I say, assessment objective two is split into two parts, with assessment objective two being new to the grid, looking at the analysis and evaluation to make judgments and reach conclusions. And this table from the specification shows again the weighting of each of the assessment objectives in the IAS and the full A-level qualifications, and how it breaks down between the AS in the table on the top and the full A level in the table at the bottom. And you'll notice there's slightly more emphasis on application and correspondingly less on recall in the full A level. Okay, so more recall in the first part of the A level, slightly less recall, a bit more application in the second part, as you'd expect, as it's becoming more in depth. Going on to look at the question types that are used in the advanced level papers. What types of question are asked? Papers on the content units, that's units one, two, four, and five, include a mixture of different question styles, and they include multiple choice questions, short open questions, calculations, open response questions, and extended writing questions. Papers on the practical skills units, units three and six, have all of these question styles, except multiple choice. And over the next five slides, I'm going to show you an example of each of these five categories of question. Just an example to see how they're, how they're arranged. So here's an example to start with of a multiple choice question. You can see this particular question says, a car is traveling at velocity V, the driver applies the brakes and the car decelerates until it comes to rest. The work done by the brakes on the car is W. Which of the following expressions is correct? And then candidates have got an option of four possible answers, of which one is correct. So the label A, B, C, and D got W proportional to V, W proportional to V squared, W proportional to 1 over V, or W proportional to 1 over B squared. And candidates have to choose which of those expressions is the correct one to express the relationship between work done by the brakes and the velocity v. There's no penalty for a wrong answer. There's, so there's no advantage whatsoever to students leaving the answer blank. Even if they're not absolutely sure of the answer, of course, the student can improve their odds of getting a correct answer by eliminating those that they know to be incorrect. But as I said, there's no advantage in leaving it blank. Sometimes students think they start off with a pile of marks and each wrong answer knocks one of those marks off. That's not the case. If they get the answer wrong, they get zero, but they don't get any negative marks. So please encourage students to put an answer in, even a straightforward guess from somebody who knew no physics. Obviously, they've got 25% chance of getting a correct answer. Um, they can improve those odds by eliminating answers that they know, oh, it can't possibly be that or that, so I'll choose between the last two. So please encourage students to complete these. Here's an example of part of a short open question. The full question has several such parts, including calculations. And you can see here, 
that the marks available are included, the sort of slightly faded number over to the right hand side in, in parentheses, the two, suggests there are two marks for this answer. The multiple choice questions are all one mark each. But this one says it's available for two marks, and you can see there are five dotted lines for the so for the um, answer to be placed on here. An answer which doesn't include reference to conduction electrons will not gain both marks. So the question says a light-dependent resistor, LDR, has a resistance of 6,100 ohms when illuminated with indoor lighting. Explain how the resistance of an LDR changes with illumination. Your answer should include reference to conduction electrons. That's not just a handy hint. That's saying if you don't do that, you won't get the marks. So I encourage students to treat suggestions like that in a question as absolute instructions. They need to include reference to conduction electrons. And of course, the key word in here is the command word. I guarantee that if you ask a group of either GCSE or A-level students, you know, show them a exam, a question, a, a, a question, an exam question like this, and ask them which is the most important word in this question, a significant number of your students will choose the one which talks about the topic. So they might say resistance or electronics, or they might even say the LDR. No, no, no. The most important word in this question is the command word, which in this case is explain. Because it's that that tells students what it is they need to do with the question. Failing to understand the importance of the command word can lead students to look at the question and write something else that they know about resistance or LDRs, any of those things. And it might be completely correct, but if it doesn't answer the question that's being asked, they won't get the marks. Explain is a very specific command word, which means they need to say what happens and why does it happen. So their answer is going to need to have a because in it or a word that means something like because. And if they don't do that, they won't get the two marks. So it's really, really important. I, I get students to go through and underline the command word before they try to tackle the question to remind them that's the question that's being asked. It's heartbreaking when you look at students' attempts at answers and you think, here's a student who clearly understood physics, but they can't get the marks because they haven't answered the question that's being asked. Instead, they've answered a question that wasn't asked and don't get the marks. OK, calculation questions. There's an example of a calculation part question. And as, as before, the full question has several parts. And as again, uh, the, the number of marks that are available for this question is indicated. It's three in this case. It would be essential for students to show they're working out. OK, it says zinc has a work function of 4.3 electron volts. Calculate the maximum wavelength of light that will produce the photoelectric effect with zinc. When I say it's essential for students to show they're working out, that's me speaking as a physics teacher. If they get the fully correct answer with units, with no working out showing, shown, if their, work, if their answer is fully correct at the bottom with the units, it will gain the full three marks. But, and it's a big but, if an error has been made in any one of the preceding steps, and it's much more easy to make errors when you're in the high pressure situation of an exam, students are nervous, it's easy to make errors, even press the wrong buttons on the calculator. If a single error has been made, then if they've only put the answer, they can't possibly get anything other than zero. If they've shown they're working, even if an error has been made in one of the steps, it will still be possible to gain two of the three marks. For example, in this case, by use of the two key equations, phi equals hf and c equals f lambda. So, I'm the kind of old fashioned teacher. I won't even mark a student's attempt at calculation unless they've shown the full working out. But the exam board are more lenient than I am. If they've got the correct answer, they will get the full marks. But please, please hammer into your students the importance of showing the logical working out. Show the steps of the calculation they've done. The equations or the formulae that they're choosing, rearranging the formula, substituting the data into that formula, finally evaluating that. If they show each step, and they make any error whatsoever, the marker can still credit them for all the correct work they've done, even though there's an error in there. So please insist that they do that. Show your working every single time. Open response questions. Here's an example of an open response part of a question. The full question, again, has several parts. Now, in this case, I've 
cut out the lines, the dotted lines for them to put their answer because there are a lot of lines provided in the actual paper than shown here for the actual response. The question says, the diagram shows the path of a beam of light traveling from a light source in air to a 45 degree glass prism. The path taken by the beam of light is shaded. The critical angle for glass is 41 degrees. You can see the diagram there. And students are asked to explain the path of the beam of light. Another explain question. And you can see this is worthy of four marks. So they need to put quite a bit of detail in there to show a full explanation of what's happening at each of the boundaries. Three, three boundaries where the air meets the glass, within the glass, and as it leaves the glass. Extended writing. And often physics students struggle with these. They find them a little bit intimidating. Big blank uh, sheet of paper. You can see the question I've blown up at the top left-hand corner, but a screenshot of the full page is shown down in the bottom right, and you can see all those lines, whatever it is, about 20 lines or so for their answer. So quite a lot of space for students to spell out their answer. As I say, some physics students find that intimidating. Students who choose A-level physics may not have written an essay for a couple of years, you know, and, you know, so they need, they need boosting their confidence with doing this. The full question, as I say, has several parts, but only one extended open response question, uh, section. Students should be encouraged to attempt these. Students find them a little bit intimidating and sometimes think, oh, I can't possibly get all the marks on that and back out of doing it all together. And that's a real mistake because even if they're not confident of getting full marks, it's really not very common for students to achieve zero marks if they attempt it. The mark scheme for this question starts with this question assesses a student's ability to show a coherent and logically structured answer with linkages and fully sustained reasoning. Marks are awarded for indicative content and for how the answer is structured and shows line of reasoning. It's actually quite easy to get the first one or two marks and it's only to get, you can see the uh, paper as a whole, the question as a whole is worth of six marks. But to get the first two or three marks is not actually that difficult. It gets harder to get the full marks. So please encourage students to tackle them, even if they can't get right to the end. It's worth emphasising from what I've just said from the mark scheme, uh, recall of indicative content. So just recall of a series of facts, disconnected facts, will not score full marks by itself. In order to score full marks, there need to be a number of linkages. So there need to be a number of facts and ways in which they link. This leads on to that, or these two facts lead on to this conclusion. So there needs to be within the language ways in which the information is linked to make a full answer. And that's the bit that candidates find hard, quite honestly. In most cases, the maximum out of six marks that can be scored for content alone, just disconnected facts, will be four marks. To get the final two, they need to show a logical progression and links between the different ideas to make a coherent explanation of the answer. So let's have a look at the mark schemes. Here's the prints of a few mark schemes from, uh, from last autumn. So mark schemes and for each series of papers, there's a corresponding examiner's report, principal examiner feedback, where it gives further information about how students did within that um, within that paper. So the mark scheme simply explains what I'm about to show to you in a moment, but the examiner's report has further information which is really helpful for us as teachers, particularly in terms of how we teach the next cohort doing the same, uh, the same topic. So what's in the mark schemes? As you'd expect, there are the answers to the questions, obviously. But they also will often give a number of alternative answers that students might give. And will tell you whether or not you can credit those alternative answers. They can show indicative content to guide markers. And they also advise a marker of common errors, what you can credit and what you cannot credit. Examiners are encouraged to use the mark scheme positively and to look to reward marks for what is there rather than penalise students for what isn't. So a bit like I said about the misunderstanding that students sometimes have when I was talking about multiple choice questions, 
it's not uncommon for us as teachers to do a little bit of that when we're trying to mark exam papers and that's not the way examiners work we they don't take off um, marks for errors but rather add marks for positive uh, creditable work and there are implications to that a little bit more positive here's an example it's a screenshot from a section of the mark scheme to paper two i've not really put that up to read out in detail it's really to show to illustrate the type of information that's included within the mark scheme question numbers down the left hand column you can see in the wider column in the middle the answer column as the type of answer that's required, as well as acceptable alternatives which are shown and further clarification where needed. So you can see there's quite a bit of detail there. If we look down at 13b2, the bottom part of here, you can see one way of doing it is outlined at the top in a way of getting three marks, use of i equals q over t, etc. Or an alternative way of carrying out that calculation and how that would amount to three marks. In the right hand column, it shows the maximum number of marks that students can get from that paper. So even if they did both alternatives in that section I just mentioned, they couldn't build up six marks from that. The maximum number of marks they can get is three, but there are different ways in which they can earn those three marks. There are no marks for quoting the formula, but for using it. So in the example 13a, the top part of this, it's the rearranged formula that gets a mark and the evaluation that gets the second mark. Okay, so use of V equals W over Q for one mark, and W equals, and the answer they've given there, 7.92 times 10 to the five joules for the second mark with the unit there included. The mark scheme gives quite a lot of detail, not just about the correct answer, but other alternatives and ways in which students can build up uh, marks to get to, get to that. I'm just aware there's a delivery van arrived on my drive and I may have to just go and check. No, I'm OK, I think. Here's a screenshot, a screenshot at the top and bottom half, just to fit on the screen, of a more detailed sort of mark scheme for an extended writing question. Again, it's not really to consider in great detail at this stage, but just worth pointing out that this type of mark scheme awards marks for a number of indicative marking points. The table at the top of the page, in other words, on the left of this slide, shows those indicative marking points and how they add together to give a number of marks. There are also marks awarded, as you can see in the second table on the right hand side of the slide, for structure and lines of reasoning. Examples of suitable indicative content are shown at the foot of the page. OK, so quite a lot of detail in a mark scheme for the extended writing questions and different ways in which students can build up the number of marks. The indicative content are essentially specification points, ones which students can correctly put to, um, to gain the marks which are awarded. Okay, I do apologise. I'm going to have to take one minute out just to accept this delivery that's arriving because I'm in on my own here. So please accept my apologies for the next minute or two. I'm just going to leave the meeting for a second and I'll be back within a minute. Any apologies? And we're back. Apologies for that. The joys and hazards of working from home. Sorry about that. OK.
moving on. It's worth us spending just a little time looking at the general marking guidance because it addresses some common misconceptions which can arise when teachers have not themselves been exam markers. In particular, I want to draw attention to some of the phrases which emphasise that wherever possible, the aim is to credit good work rather than to punish errors. It's worth saying that when teachers engage in marking or moderation exercises, marking blind students' attempts at exam questions and then comparing their marks with those awarded by the real examiner, then teachers almost invariably mark more harshly than examiners do. It's also worth adding that if you do a similar exercise with students, they're often the harshest markers of all, and that's because they tend to have in their mind this idea that it's a perfect answer to get full marks, and if a student gets anything less than a perfect answer, they start knocking marks off. That's not what markers do. That's not the system followed by examiners. So in the general marking guidance, mark schemes should be applied positively. Candidates must be rewarded for what they have shown they can do rather than penalised for omissions. There's no ceiling on achievement. All marks on the mark scheme should be used appropriately. And all of the marks on the mark scheme are designed to be awarded. Examiners should always award full marks if they're deserved, i.e. if the answer matches the mark scheme. And an implication of that is that for an answer to get full marks, it doesn't have to be perfect. As you'll see when we look at the exemplars and when you look at other exemplars yourself, answers which have got some errors in them can still be worthy of full marks. If it meets the criteria for all of the marks on the mark scheme, then it gets full marks, even if, they're in, even if there are errors in there. When examiners are in doubt regarding the application of the mark scheme to a candidate's response, the team leader must be consulted. Crossed out work should be marked unless the candidate has replaced it with an alternative response. That's the thing that's well worth students knowing. Even if they've crossed out the work, if they've done a calculation and then thought, oh no, I've got that all around my ears and put a line through it or cross it out and perhaps have another go, even the part of the work that's being crossed out can be given marks as long as it's readable. So please do encourage students, if they're going to cross out a piece of work, not to scribble it out completely so it's unreadable, but just put a line through it so the marker can still see it. Because if it turned out that their first answer had some mark-worthy parts in it, they can still be credited with those marks, even though it's been crossed out, unless they've replaced it with a very a contra a contradicting response. OK. So, a question to consider. Over here on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see there's a question. A student carried out an experiment to determine the resistivity, the resistivity of a metal in the form of a wire. She made the following measurements. Length of wire, resistance of wire, diameter of wire, and the data for that. Determine the metal of the wire using information from the table below. So they use the data in the table to identify what we think the um, wire is that the student has made the measurements on. What I want to ask you is which assessment objectives do you think are being assessed in this part of an exam question? And to help you, rather than flicking back to a slide, I've copied the part which describes what the four assessment objectives are, AO1, AO2A and AO2B and AO3. What I want you to do is decide which assessment objective is being assessed, or objectives if you like, are being assessed in this part of an exam question. I say assessment objectives because each question can be one or two assessment objectives. Markers are asked not to try to assess more than two in any one question. So it could be one of them or it could be two. And we're getting some suggestions. AO2B from Shabam. AO2, hedging your bets there, I'm in, because AO2 is in two parts. Do you think it's all of AO2 or AO2, A or B? And any answers from other people on the call? We're now up to 17 participants, so I'm looking for some more answers coming in.
<clears throat> okay, we're getting some couple of suggestions. Quite a few people thinking it's AO2 and some people saying AO2B. And in fact, that's the answer. It's AO2 part B. Okay, AO2B. The examiner report on this paper suggested that this was the first question, <laughs> the first question that had been asked in the newer specification, which targeted this new assessment objective. So it has been highlighted by the examiner as the first example of the use of this new assessment objective. Remember, AO2 has been spl split into parts A and B, with AO2A being application of knowledge and understanding in familiar and unfamiliar contexts, and B being analysis and evaluation of scientific information to make judgments and reach conclusions. And that's what's happening in this paper. The student has made measurements, but they've been asked to make judgments and reach a conclusion, the conclusion being the metal of the wire. It's worth adding that these open-ended questions require a justification. Simply stating that the answer is a number will not score the marks. Many candidates who score nothing on this on this question or an answer like this, a uh, question like this, gave the answer without any justification or conclusion, and so didn't score. In many cases, the command word gives away the assessment objective that it draws upon. In this case, the command word determine suggests they're using data to come to a conclusion. They're being asked if their answer is going to include the word either aluminium or tungsten or iron. It's going to have a conclusion in there. So the command word is a clue towards which assessment objective is being, um, is being addressed. OK, thank you. Another activity. How can we encourage students to develop confidence in tackling questions such as this one that we're going to look at in a moment, where the context is different from that in which the concept was initially learned? So here's the example of the question. The photograph, a little bit dark on my screen, but the photograph shows a machine used for surveying the seabed. A communications cable connects the machine to a ship on the surface. And it gives the source, the website source, where that photograph's come from. The material used in the outer casing of the communications cable must withstand the large pressures at the seabed and yet be light enough to lift out of the water. Then it gives the density of Kevlar and the density of steel in kilograms per metre cubed. Deduce whether steel or Kevlar is more suitable to use in the outer casing of a communications cable at the seabed. So... The question is, how can we encourage students to develop confidence in tackling questions like this one, where the context is different from that in which the concept was initially learned? So I'm not asking you to tackle this particular question or how you'd encourage students to tackle this. It's just an illustration of the principle that's embedded in AO2A, application of knowledge and understanding of science in familiar and unfamiliar contexts. How do we give students confidence to be able to tackle questions such as this one? Because students who've been taught well throughout the course will certainly have learned about the, the physics principle here, about properties and materials, but they're very unlikely to have learned it in the context of a cable going to a machine on the seabed. You know, this is an unfamiliar context. How do we develop student, a student's confidence in being able to tackle questions where the question is being asked in a different context from that in which it was initially taught or learned. Suggestions into the meeting chat, please. How do we de develop students' confidence to tackle these sorts of questions? Because there's no question that students lack confidence. Many, many students demonstrate a lack of confidence if they're being asked to tackle a question which is in a different context. I'll stay quiet for a minute too while people put suggestions into the uh, meeting chat.
encourage the students to focus on the key information. For example, low density means the material is light. Yeah. So showing students where to focus in the question. Mayer said, I think it comes down to the teaching method. When students are exam focused, they're being taught how to score the exams rather than being taught the actual content. It's a very good point. Yeah, so it's a change in philosophy and aims when we're actually doing the teaching. Shivam has said, use a range of contexts when students practice calculations in class, but still focusing on the key thought processes. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with all with, with that, definitely. Um, it would be impossible, I'm sure you'd accept, it would be impossible to second guess and teach in advance every possible different context which examiners might come up with. There must be thousands of them, thousands of different contexts in which you could ask a similar sort of question using the properties such as density in this case, properties of materials. It would be impossible to second guess all those contexts and teach them all. The key is in developing confidence, as it says in the question, developing confidence in students that they've learned the scientific knowledge and understanding and so have the ability to apply it to understanding other similar situations where the same scientific ideas and principles apply. So as Mayer said, I would say having an open-minded approach when teaching. Yeah, focusing on the idea itself and then asking different questions, not necessarily past paper, getting students to think. Absolutely. We develop this confidence by regularly asking and discussing other context questions even perhaps asking students, OK, what other context could the thing we've just learned about be applied in? What sort of questions might examiners come up with to, so that students start to realise how broad the application of general physics principles are? You know, that's that's the power of the subject in a sense, isn't it? You learn something about waves. You can then apply it to thousands of different contexts where waves are applicable. That, that's the breadth of the power of science generally, that it's broadly applicable, universal other ways, of course, are perhaps by reading and discussing science related items from the news or other sources where we can apply scientific understanding, scientific literacy, if you like, to real world situations. There's a good example of this lack of confidence in an AS paper not very long ago that I, I, I was I saw in a group I was teaching. Um, we obviously taught everybody would have taught as part if they taught the specification would have taught um, internal resistance, the ideas of internal resistance. But the question which came up in this AS paper uh, was about internal resistance, but the picture and the example it gave was one of these novelty clocks that you could buy in a novelty shop where the power source, it was a digital clock, but the power source was a potato. In other words, you put a potato in there and there were two different electrodes, different you know, electrodes made of different metals, which you pierced into the potato and the difference in the potential gave you the power source to drive the digital clock and a large number of able students if in effect threw up their hands in horror and said i haven't been taught about potatoes the question wasn't about potatoes it was about internal resistance and you literally asked from the data that it was given how could they calculate the internal resistance of the cell in this case the potato with the two electrodes but what students lacked, many students, was the confidence to say, I know how to work out internal resistance. I can apply it to this new situation. And it's giving them that confidence by discussing other opportunities and giving opportunities to apply what they've learned in one context. Give them some examples of how they might apply it in other situations. So if they have confidence that, OK, I know the physics. How do I apply it to this situation? Rather than, no, I haven't been taught this specific context. The reason I'm flogging a dead horse on this one, you know, going on and on about it, is it comes up so often in every single examiner report that I've seen on this specification and indeed some other specifications, is that students struggle to apply learning from one context to questions set in another. And it's not an off chance that that will happen. It will absolutely happen. Examiners, the people setting the exams, are required to set questions which test that knowledge and understanding in unfamiliar contexts. So you know it's going to happen. We're going to prepare students <clears throat> for that situation. Okay, 
a really useful resource for teachers and departments, and also for use with students, are the exemplars. This slide on the left shows the cover of one such that is downloadable in PDF format. You can download the exemplars from the um, from the website. <clears throat> They're free. It has marked examples of real students' attempts at the questions. In this case, in a Unit 3 exam, so the practical exam, but there are collections of other uh, papers. After each series of papers, sets of exemplars are produced. Some are put in the examiner reports on each sequence, and sometimes they're grouped together as a group of exemplars in, in a booklet like this. You can see an example of it on the right here. That's not really for detailed discussion of the content, that will come later, but just to illustrate the type of information that's included in these exemplars. Okay, so you can see the exemplar shows a student's response, that's a, re a real student's uh, attempt at an exam question, and the examiner's comment underneath, which shows in the purple print there what, what mark it was given, and then quite a bit of information of why that mark was awarded. So they include one or more examples of students' attempts at a question with the examiner's mark awarded and a commentary on why that mark was justified. They're really good for getting inside the mind of the examiners, for distinguishing the features which make a good answer and distinguish it from an OK answer, and from learning how to interpret the mark scheme. Really important information. Here's an extract from one of the exemplar materials that's available. I'm going to ask you to use it in this case. I'm going to invite you to look at the part question that's shown and the answer mark scheme shown at the foot of the slide. On the next slide, I'm going to give you two examples of real students attempts at this question and ask you to award marks for it. So if we look at it, first of all, it's, as I say, it's from an IAS exemplars document. And here's the part question in the blue background on the right. A yo-yo is a toy that consists of two connected discs on a piece of string. I guess most toy shops don't sell their yo-yos with that description, but that's basically what it is, of course. A child stands in a stationary train holding a yo-yo. The train accelerates and the string moves into the position shown at an angle theta to the vertical. So you can see on our picture, the train is moving to the right, so the yo-yo swings towards the child to the left. Question A. Draw the free body force diagram for the yo-yo when the train is accelerating. So there's the question. And you can see on the mark scheme on the left, weight or W or MG labelled will gain one mark, and tension, T labelled, will gain the other mark. Maximum two marks available. OK, let's have a look at some examples then. Here's two students' attempts at this. So part of the... Diagram of part A is one student's attempt, student A attempt at this question, and B is a separate student's attempt at the same question. And I've reproduced the mark scheme again, so we don't have to keep flicking back to the previous slide. What mark would you give for each of these two attempts? So for each of them, A could be zero or one or two. It can't be more than two, so two because two is the maximum. So your answer could be A1 or A2 or A0 and B, 0 or 1 or 2. So that's how I'd like you to put your answers, please, into the meeting chat. So decide what mark you would award using that mark scheme for these two attempts, and then you can put A and the mark you would give for A, and B and the mark you would give for B. And I'll stay quiet again to let you concentrate on that and have a go at marking those two attempts at this part of the answer. How would you apply that mark scheme in these two examples? And then I'll tell you what the examiner came up with. Very generous people, I approve, I approve. two and two, both Joam and May. Any more for any more? We still have 17 people in the call, so leaving myself and Lloyd out of it, we should be getting 15 sets of marks in here.
Anyone else going to submit marks? Come on, I feel like Shabam and May are doing all the work here. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to have to move one, I think. It's a shame. Oh, there we go. Two and one. So two for A and one for B. Thank you. And two for A and two for B. So quite a lot of agreement on that. So everyone's awarded student A two marks so far. And we've got three twos and a one for student B. Let's have a look at what the examiner came up with. Another two two. Oh, Robert's amended his mark. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at what the examiner said. Okay. Here's the examiner's marks. They've given exemplar A one mark and B two marks. Okay. But they also give some explanation. This can exemplar A, this candidate has drawn both of the forces expected to score the two marks, but has added in the components of tension in both the horizontal and vertical planes. This might have been acceptable if both of the components of T drawn had been dotted lines. In this case, the T sine theta is drawn as a solid line, so this candidate scores just one mark, because it looks as though they've put in three separate forces, the T yeah, the, the, the T actual, the N, I can't read that, the T, N, yeah, N square, and the T sine theta and the weight, it looks like they've put in three solid lines for three forces. Exemplar B, oh, tension, thank you, tension, thank you. Um, exemplar B, two marks. Ideally, lines of force will be drawn using a ruler, the marker has said. However, this candidate has scored both marks, even though the lines are not completely straight. This is because it's completely clear which directions the weight and tension are acting. There are no additional forces drawn, so all is correct. So that's their explanation, if you like. So it's worth it's worth it just mentioning. You might well have marked these differently. In fact, several people, yeah, did give two for A, and I, you know, I credit you on your generosity on that. Um, and so there is a range of marks, but the point of using these, the point of these exemplars, is not for us just to challenge the way in which the mark scheme has been interpreted, but rather to recognise that these exemplars can be a really important tool for teachers and students in finding out how the mark scheme is interpreted in practice. I watch quite a lot of football. I go to live football matches, but I also watch quite a lot on TV. And in the English Premiership, as I know in some other leagues, uh, they've introduced in the last couple of years a thing called VAR, Video Assistant Ref, where in addition to the referee on the on the field, um, there's a video assistant ref. And if there's a controversial decision, often penalty decisions or, or goals, uh, where there's a, perhaps an offside or something, the video assistant ref will come and, and look back at the recording on various camera angles and advise the ref, who they're linked to with a radio link, on what the decision should have been, and they will change their decision. And we're here sitting at home watching the TV, and we always disagree with the ref, particularly if they've made a decision which goes against the team we were supporting. But when we see the VAR, we can disagree with those as well. But at least we get the explanation. And the more we, you know, we might be shouting and screaming at the screen that we disagree with the decision they've made. But we do get to see their thinking. We get their explanation of why they've awarded that situation. And the more we watch it and the more we listen to the explanations, the closer we get to understanding how they're interpreting the law. We might still not agree with it, 
but it gets us inside the minds of the referee and why the decision they're making. And that's what these exemplars are good for. You know, we can work in our classrooms and in our departments and think I wouldn't have given that mark for this. You know, and I might have disagreements personally with why these marks have been awarded. But what it does tell us is this is the way in which the mark scheme is being interpreted by examiners and groups of examiners in committees discussing these. And that's really useful information. I hope you'll agree. Even if we don't agree with that interpretation, it gets us closer to understanding how they're applying the mark scheme in real situations. So it's a really useful ex exercise to do with colleagues, I would suggest. If you have several people within your school teaching the same subject at the same level, it's a really good thing in a department meeting, a really good use of time to do this sort of exercise that we've just done. Get someone to photocopy some of the exemplar questions and take out the answers part. So you just have the exemplar answers and the mark scheme and get colleagues all to mark them blind as we just did. Discuss the marks you're giving and then look at the examiner's marks and their explanation, the examiner's comments on why they've given the marks they did. It's really useful activity in getting inside the heads of the examiner. And as I say, it's also a really useful um, exercise to do with students when they are approaching the exams, when they're getting close to understanding and looking at how they can glean the extra few marks from exam papers. It's a really useful exercise to do with students because they too can start to see, OK, this is what the examiners are looking for. This is what distinguishes a perfect answer from an OK answer. This is where the marks are buried. It's a really useful exercise. When I first started teaching, I used to think that these exemplars and feedback from the exam board was somebody else's issue. It's for the exams officer or my head of department. The further I went into this was the more I realised that it's really useful information for me as a classroom teacher. I, I, I agree entirely with what May is saying. I wish my students could attend this training. They don't believe me when I comment on the precision of their answers. They think I'm being unreasonable. So do, I would strongly encourage doing this sort of exercise with them, photocopy, take some copies of exemplars, leaving the marks out and let them try marking them for themselves so they can put themselves in the shoes of the examiner, walk a mile in their moccasins and see what the issues are. And they're much more likely then to get engaged with, with the decisions that are being made. It's not always straightforward. You think, you know, Everybody outside of physics and maths think, oh, it's dead easy to mark these subjects because it's either right or it's wrong. No, no, no. We all know it within the subject that's not the case. There's so much interpretation and nuance. And the more we get inside doing these activities, the more we and our students can start to understand where those boundaries are between the decisions and, and, and particularly how the examiners are interpreting this mark scheme. Strongly recommend that. It's a really good use of time, really good teaching um, act activity. Okay, thank you for that. Let's have a look at assessment of practical work and exam techniques. Assessment of practical work. As we mentioned earlier, all of the assessment of practical work is in the final written exams on units three and six, about 20% of the total marks. There's no practical exam, no assessed practicals in this course. It's all on those two exams. And this is increases the need over what, what might have happened in other specifications or older specifications. It increases the need for learning during practical lessons to be planned carefully so that students develop the skills necessary to tackle those exam questions. I think I used the same phrase yesterday, that we have to shift our philosophy of what we're doing in practical lessons away from what are students doing to what are students learning to think when we're planning practical activities and experimental um, investigations, what are students learning from this activity? And the practical guide, which is shown on the right hand side there, is an invaluable tool to aid this area of learning. Let's have a closer look at the practical guide. Again, it's a document you can download freely from the website under teaching and learning materials. Here's an outline of what's included in each chapter of the Practical Guide for Teachers. There's practical assessment, the whole picture, assessment of practical skills, using core practical to teach skills, mapping core practicals for math skills development, teaching approaches to core practicals, answers to the student guide questions, 
So remember, there's a student guide too, which is well worth looking at and providing for your students. Again, you can download that or you can buy copies. And you've got to decide whether or not the printing costs or you can download it. And if your students have access to digital, um, you know, laptops or whatever, or tablets, they can have the digital version, which you can download freely. And it also contains core practical questions to enhance learning and the answers to those questions. Student records. Here's an extract from the practical guide regarding students keeping a record of their lab work. It says possible formats for students to keep records of their practical work include a lab book. This has some advantages, mainly in being a working document where students can write notes on procedures, as well as take down data, sketch rough graphs and so on. A folder of practical work, having the advantage of being able to store worksheets and other stimulus material alongside the practical notes. Integrating practical notes into the student's main folder. Whichever format you decide works best, and I would highlight that bit, there's a decision to be made there, whichever format you decide works best. It's important that the method of collecting and recording the practical work that students do meets the following re requirements. To be a useful revision aid for students at the end of their course, and to allow students to record evidence in a variety of formats, such as diagrams, drawings, tables, graphs, and so on. It would also include space for any data analysis or evaluation. There is a decision to be made, and I put it to you, that your students won't necessarily make the best decision at the start of the course. There isn't one right answer to this. What will work for one teacher in one class might not be the best for another. But it's well worth you having some time discussing this with students at the beginning. Because if you say, OK, they're adults now, young adults, they can make their own decision. It's something they won't have thought about at the beginning. And if you leave it to the end of the first term and students then think, I made a wrong decision three months ago, I'm keeping my practical work in a unmanageable situation. I can't get it all together. There's no way I can check back through the way in which I'm keeping my... It's too late to put it right. They've got to go back over three months' work to reorganise it, and, and they're unlikely to do that. So it's well worth having that conversation early on in the course and perhaps giving students some advice about the way you suggest they keep their practical work together, whether or not it's in a lab book or in a loose leaf folder. It's worth having that discussion because students won't understand what the problem will be until they get too late to change their decision. So well worth considering that for yourself and with your students. Here's an extract from the practical guide on core practical five. And at least I'm just using this to illustrate the type of guidance that's included within the booklet. So I'm not really looking in detail at this particular practical, but just giving an example of the sort of information that's available in that practical guide. Practical five is investigating the effects of length, tension and mass per unit length on the frequency of a vibrating string or wire. You can see it says what are the three variables to test? And so it's another that makes a very good investigation and the sheets in the guide take this approach. The students might write a plan out of class and come to the lesson ready to carry it out. So clearly, clearly the theory will have to be done thoroughly first. Because it's more open-ended than some of these practical students will need to keep a complete record of all that they do from the plan onwards. And then there's some practical information, uh, tips for how to do this successfully in practice. It says it's unlikely that centres will have enough vibration transducers for a class set so if all students are to do this at the same time, a vertical alternative is possible. A wire is hung vertically with slotted masses at the bottom, an AC current is passed down the, the wire, leads attached with crocodile clips, and that should be and, and a magnetic field is placed at the centre, either a horseshoe magnet or pole-faced magnets on a yoke. This removes frequency as a variable because it's 50 hertz because you're using mains AC, that's the UK frequency anyway, unless frequency generators are available. This makes a good alternative and students can still make measurements of standing waves by varying the mass on the wire. There will be no variable to control, but students could still plan for frequency as a variable, even though they're not actually carrying that out in practice. They could make a plan for how they could do that. Safety should feature in all reports, but this one has it as a feature because there are wires under tension. And so, of course, there's a danger of the wire snapping and pinging into their eye and also hanging masses, which could drop on their foot or damage the floor or whatever. 
The data can be processed using ICT as there's a non-linear relation in the variables. So quite a lot of information about how to carry out this, this, this experiment and different possibilities. And that will be true for each of the core practicals. This and the next few slides show an example of a question testing practical skills. In a short while, I'm going to ask you to consider the implications of this type of questioning. How does it affect our teaching and learning while students are engaged in practical work? In other words, how can we teach students and enable them to learn from practical experiences so they're well equipped to answer this type of question? So here's an example question on the practical we've just been talking about. A student carried out an experiment to determine the mass per unit length mu of a string using a standing wave. The standing wave produced is shown in the diagram. The student recorded the following data shown in the table. Calculate mu given the equation below. That's the exam question. It also includes the mark scheme for that. So how the marks are awarded. And further parts of the question identify two significant sources of uncertainty in the student's measurements. For each of these sources of uncertainty, describe an experimental technique the student could have used to obtain an accurate measurement. So these are the type of questions that are being asked, looking at uh, testing the learning, the knowledge and understanding from that practical activity. So it's not just asking about the practical itself, but other implications and other transferable skills linked to that practical. And again, the accompanying mark scheme for those quite parts of the question. So you can see how the marks are awarded. So they could choose a maximum of two from the various points linked to frequency or length or mass as shown in the table there. And then finally, also for part B2 there, a description of the experimental technique and additional detail and the maximum of four from all of the possibilities listed in the table there. So quite a lot of detail shown. So the, the question and then the full mark scheme on there so the question I want to ask, in the light of those sections of the specification which describe what students will be assessed on in the practical units and that example question we've just looked at, here's the question for us now. What are the implications for teaching and learning when students are engaged in experiments and investigations? So what do we have to remember when we're teaching practical or leading practical investigations, experimental lessons, lab sessions? What do we have to, what does it imply that what we need to consider for teaching and learning when students are engaged in these sorts of experiments and investigations? Any suggestions in the meeting chat, please? Are there any things that we need to do, put more emphasis on or do more in practical lessons to address these, you know, students being able to tackle these sorts of questions? Absolutely, May. Remembering what went well and what went wrong. In the practical, you mean, in the experiment. I think it's essential that students review what they've done. They don't just do the experiment, write it up and forget it. There has to be a, a plenary, is it right? There has to be a time to discuss what happened. It's common that the first time around we do the experiment, we don't get very good results. Yeah, and it's worth it. That's real science as well. You know, they're not alone in that. People who have worked all their lives as science experimentalists will have exactly the same experience. So it's worth knowing that's not just their newness to the subject. That is the way science works. So we take a step back, review and redo. And I think learning from the one that went wrong is part of the learning. This way, when they're faced with a similar question, they know what could go wrong. So Shabam has said, asking students to consider sources of error and how the method could be proved. Excellent. Ask probing questions for them to consider while they're carrying out the practical. And there are questions to enhance learning within that core practical guide as well, which can be really useful to encourage us to ask questions which invite them to think a little bit more deeply, higher order questions, if you like, questions which students have to think about for a while and perhaps answer in parts or several students give part of the answer to. Encourage the students to relate to how it's tested, relate to theory. So I think sharing with students, you know, when they've done an experiment, some of the exam questions that are being asked on that experiment, so they get to see what sort of things they might be asked to 
answer in an exam situation related to the practical they've just done. I think one of the keys is that students need to talk about their experiment. It's essential that they discuss what they've done and share that with other people because the more they talk about their work, the more they're likely to be able to write it down in an exam situation. If they develop oracy by discussing their their learning and discussing what's happened in the practical and, uh, you know, as May suggested, what went well and what went wrong, what could be improved. If we were to do it just another time, how could we make it better? All those are good things for students to be discussing orally and sharing with one another from their own experiences when they've all done the practical or different practicals around the room. Because if they can describe it in words, they'll be able to describe it in writing much more successfully later on. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that sums that up really, that's, that's the essence of it. I think, as I say, we need to focus on our students learning these transferable skills. Are they understanding what's happening in the experiment and how they can improve and maximize and optimize their experimental techniques? Are they learning those skills in a way that they can then explain in, in response to an exam situation? As someone said earlier on, it's not all about focusing on the exam. This is how science works. If these students are going to go on, um, hopefully some of them work in scientific fields or in engineering or other, other things like that, these are exactly the skills they need to be able to develop. It's really, really important. They need to be critical of their own practice be self-reflective, reflective learners. So they reflect on what's gone well, what's not gone so well, how they can improve it. Really important step, I think. And I think it's a big change from what they're doing at GCSE up to what they're doing at A-level. It's much more reflective practice. Okay. I want to spend a little while just looking at exam technique, how we can help our students address uh, the situation of an exam. Just start with the instructions that tend to be on the front of an exam paper. This shows the general rubric on the front of one of the physics international advanced level papers. You might want to consider which points you would want to draw students' attention to in preparing for the exam, because I guarantee to you a significant number of your students will not read this page in the exam. They'll be so fired up and nervous in the exam that they'll ignore all the information on the front page and get straight into where the questions are. As soon as they can turn the paper over, they want to get into looking at the questions. And so it's worth sharing this information with them beforehand. It's going to be pretty much the same on the front of each paper. So getting students to think about this before they go into an exam might help them think of some of the important parts. I'm going to highlight some that I think are important. There may be more space than you need. You see the bit in italics at the end of the one that I've just arrowed. Answer the question in the space is provided. There may be more space than, the, than you need. They're not required to fill in the space that's provided. The key point is, have I answered the question which was asked? Not how I filled the space. And look at the exemplars in the examiner's reports. Show that answers which achieve full marks are not always longer than the, those achieving lower scores. So the answer isn't weighed or measured, it's marked, you know, uh, it doesn't have to fill all the space. Any more arrows there? Yes, we are. Show all your workings in calculations and include units where appropriate. Showing the working in a calculation is essential. As I said earlier, if the final answer is correct, then all the marks are gained. But if the answer is incorrect, Many of the marks may still be awarded for correct steps, including for steps which were correctly carried out with wrong data from a previous step. So if they make an error in step one, they don't carry on being penalised for it if they then use that correctly in the next stages. It's a thing called errors carried forward, ECF. So if they show they're working, they can gain a lot of the marks, even if they've made a simple error. The third, er the third arrow says... The marks for each question are shown in brackets. Use this as a guide to how much time to spend on each question. As a rough rule of thumb, a minute per mark is a guide to the time to be spent on each question. I'll mention this in exam tip technique later on, but one implication of that is if the multiple choice question questions are, are one mark each, students shouldn't be spending much more than a minute on each one. 
And that's the area where students sometimes run out of time, particularly conscientious students will sometimes spend too long doing the multiple choice section and run out of time for the questions which have more marks on them. I always encourage students to say, if there's a multiple choice section, leave that till the end. Because if you're going to run out of time, that's the area to run out of time on because there are fewer marks on it. Read each question carefully, the bottom one says, before you start to answer it. Absolutely essential. I hinted at it earlier on, but students often lose marks by not answering the question that was asked, but writing something else about the topic raised in the question. Their answer might be correct physics, but if it hasn't answered the question, it won't get the marks. And as I tried to say earlier, the command word is absolutely key to this. What is the question asking me to do? First part of good exam technique is preparation. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail, as the saying goes. Practice is important so students know what to expect and feel comfortable and confident when they see a paper. Students should practice past papers, but also have a chance to discuss incorrect answers and have another go if necessary, so they understand what they did wrong and how to do it right. It can be done as self-assessment or peer assessment using the mark schemes. We'll look at one suggested strategy on the next slide. So effective exam techniques need to be practiced by students using past papers or part papers, perhaps even homemade papers using exam wizard tailored to suit the exercise or focused on the particular technique being practiced. Give students such a paper to practice how to access it. Give students mark schemes so they can learn what's expected. Having a go-to strategy, a starting point, can build confidence and reduces the stress of what do I do first. Those crucial first five or ten minutes of an exam where students have still got butterflies in the stomach, you know, how do, how do we settle them down? If they have a go-to strategy, a thing that they're going to do at the start of every exam, it can help calm them down and get them into the mood of doing well in the exam itself. Here's one exam strategy. As I say, having a strategy builds confidence. Make sure that students know how a paper is ramped. In other words, the difficulty builds up through the paper. There are easier items at the start of each question. Edexcel papers always follow the same format. So if they do some past papers, they can get comfortable with what to expect, the sort of way language is used, the layout of the papers and so on. Let students know that topics can be in, in any order. So they might find later questions easier than earlier ones if they're the topics that they're more confident in. Look at bullet point three, read the question carefully. Don't repeat the stem in your answer. Many students repeat the stem of the question and then add nothing more. The examiner ignores the repeated stem, but it will never gain credit and it often wastes time and fills up space. Look through the whole paper first, underlining or better highlighting the command words in each question. Decide which question to do first. Start with the questions you feel most confident with which is not necessarily question one. There's absolutely no reason why students have to do question one and then question two and then question three and work their way through. If they are most confident on question three and question seven, they're the ones to start with because it gets them into the swing of answering questions. It builds some marks up in their mark box, as it were, and it gives them a bit more time to settle into doing the, you know, calming down so they can tackle the questions they find more difficult later on. Don't give up on a whole question. If you find one section of the question difficult, move on to the next part. So start with the low hanging fruit and then come back. The same strategy holds for whole questions that you find difficult. Move on and come back to missed questions and parts of questions when you've picked off all the easier parts. Just before I move on to the next bit, are there any are there any um, strategies that you found effective that you share with your students that you'd like to put in the meeting chat i'll just give it a moment or two for people to share any things that you found useful to help students not with the physics particularly but with tackling the exam how you know exam strategy ideas
For calculations, write down the variables with numbers. This can help identify which formula to use. Yeah, that's particularly useful with things like the SUVAT equations, I think. I have to find it's really helpful to start by just pressing SUVAT down there and putting taking the data out of the question. So you're putting it into a table so it's a, a familiar form. And as you say, it can identify which formula to use. If you've got data for S and U and V, but not A and T, and T is the thing you're trying to find out, you can think, which is the equation I need to use, which includes the stuff I've got and the thing I want. So yeah, it can be really, really useful. I'm running a little bit dry here, but I usually go for, trust yourself, you've got this. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to build in students the confidence that they've learned the material. If they've done the work, they can actually score well. I think students sometimes, particularly the people who are most nervous going into an exam, are often the brightest and the most conscientious students because they can see there's always more you could have done, as it were. So you're right, trust yourself. Don't leave anything empty. Yeah, try. It could always award some marks. Don't overcomplicate things. There's no conspiracy theory here. It is as simple as it seemed. Yeah, I think students sometimes think, oh, that's a really straightforward answer. It can't be that. It must be more complicated than that. No, no, no. You know, the, the, the question paper is ramped. So some of the questions will be easier than others. If it sometimes seems easy, it might just be so. Diagrams, I, I'm a big fan of diagrams, I have to say. Even if the question doesn't require a diagram as an answer, particularly in things like forces questions, I can find, I find it really useful to sketch out the situation so you can picture it. If it's a written question, sketching out a diagram of the situation can really, really help. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for those. Just want to mention walking, talking mocks. I don't know whether you're already familiar with these. Uh, there are some Pearson videos available online. They're on YouTube, but you can also find them through the Pearson website and the, the teaching and learning materials. There are videos of science examiners and trainers delivering 10-minute walking, talking mocks. You can use them directly with students, but they're also a good model of how teachers might run walking, talking mocks of their own. Let me just talk you through how it works. Students sit in the same exam room where they'll do their exam preferably in the same seats, you know, if they're alphabetical or whatever. It can be done in the classroom, but it's not always effective in building confidence in exam conditions. The closer it is to how it will be in the real exam, the more likely it is that students will remember that in the exam and be able to repeat those sort of strategies, calming strategies. So students are given an exam paper, which is close to being like the real thing as possible. And then students are literally walked through every question on the paper. So if you were talking a group of your physics students through a walking, talking mock, you, they would have a paper and you would have the question on the whiteboard at the front and you'd literally talk through how you would tackle this question. So you'd do things like underline the keywords. This is how I'm going to plan. I'll take the data out. This is how I'm going to lay my answer out. So you'd literally do the questions if you were a student, but talking students through each step. This is why I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm going to write that down. This is how I'm going to tackle it. This is what the question is asking. So literally thinking out loud so students can hear your thought process as you go through the question. You might focus on a particular area, such as maths questions or questions based on devising a practical investigation to focus on that. But then crucially, when you've done that, students then tackle the paper you've just told them how to do. See, it sounds like it's repeating, but it's really building in that sort of muscle memory. Students write their responses then in timed conditions. They should do really well on that because you've just told them how you would do the question. But they, them doing it again really helps build confidence. This is how to tackle this sort of question. And it will give them strategies that they'll use in a real exam. And particularly strategies to help calm them down and tackle questions positively. And also give them that confidence that, oh, yes, actually, some of the, these are doable. I have got this. Have a go. At it. If you haven't tried it before, it can be a really useful strategy for building confidence with students, particularly when they're approaching the time when the exams are coming up. Now, support. I went through the types of support yesterday, and I think everybody on the call today was in yesterday's module one. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to skip through fairly quickly, I think, the slides, because it's just kind of repeating what was here yesterday. I don't think we've got anyone who wasn't here for yesterday's session. 
please let me know if that's not the case. So we looked at types of support available include teaching and learning materials, past papers, mark schemes and examiner's reports, teacher resource packs and published resources, student books, lab books and teacher guides. And all of them are accessible, through, you know, there are other ways through it, but here's the main page, the International Advanced Level Physics in the um, is it 2018 simply refers to the year in which the, this um, specification was launched. And the page is covered in hyperlinks, so hot links to other pages which have the data. So you can see particularly on the, the blue background box towards the right hand side, there are links to specification and sample assessments, massive range of exam materials, largely past papers, but also the mark schemes to those past papers, the examiner reports, collections of exemplars, all in that exams materials. Uh, box and also a hyperlink to teaching and learning materials. So additional materials covering things like the mathematics in A-level physics, links with other specifications, sort of um, cross, cross links and cross references uh, and guides for new parts of the topic and other things like that. So do have a look through there to see if there are things which are useful for you. Sorry, I didn't say how to get to that. The um, You can either remember the URL, but actually an easy way to get to it is simply to use a search engine and put Edexcel and IAL or International Advanced Level, and it will take you to a page with a list of all the subjects. You can just scroll down. They're arranged alphabetically. That's, that's the way I get to it. There is a, as I said, there's a hyperlink, um, the qualifications.pearson.com but it's usually easier to find it via a search engine. Exemplar materials that I mentioned, and we've spoken about them during this course, uh, getting started guides, which are useful when you're new to the specification, as I guess you are because you're on this particular course. And again, all of these documents are downloadable through the teaching and learning materials tab on that uh, web page teacher mathematics support covering selected topics that students find difficult and ways of introducing the maths that they need for the advanced level physics. I'm guessing most students doing A-level physics will also be doing A-level maths, but not all centres make that compulsory and it will be useful for you to know which of your students are and aren't. And also what order the maths department are teaching their topics in so you know whether they've covered essential skills by the time you get to that, the need for that in particular topic. The teacher practical guides, which we spent some time looking at during this session. Suggested schemes of work. And published resources, as I mentioned yesterday, Pearson are of course a publisher as well as um, an exam board. And so there are, we publish books. There is no requirement for you to buy Pearson books in or Pearson textbooks in order to deliver Pearson specifications. We believe they're good, but other good textbooks are available. If you've had previous good experience of using uh, another textbook, as long as you check that it's covering the material at the right level, then do go ahead and use it. Also, lab books, that is one of the ways of covering the question we asked earlier about how students store the work that they've done and record the work that they're doing in experiments. And another plug for our subject advisor, who is a, a gold mine of information about everything to do with the science specifications, including these ones that we've been discussing today. This is Irene and various ways in which you can contact her. Um, if she doesn't personally know the answer to your question, she will direct it to someone who does. So I strongly recommend things like e email contacts so that she can push your email forward to someone who will get back to you. She's really, really efficient and knows her stuff. 